Now, a new year, which is, this is what it is, this is, is a time when, I guess, traditionally many of us decide to make changes in our life. Um, we've, we've just entered a new year. In fact, we've actually just entered a new decade. Now, two of my boys, uh, Scott, who's not here, and Daniel, who is here, were born at the start of a decade. So one was in, must have been 1990, and one was in the year 2000. And so what that means is every time a new decade rolls around, they're basically entering a new decade of their life. So for, for, for Daniel, that's pretty much going to encompass all of his 20s is going to happen in, the, in this next decade. Um, you know, at the end of it, he's going to be turning 30. Well, that sounds pretty old. Um, Scott, well, he's going to go through his 30s, and he's going to be, t- I don't mention it to him, but he's, he's, he's been turning 40 at the end of this coming decade. Now, when you look at sort of younger people, and even younger than that, you know, it's easy to see that their lives are going to be very different. You know, I mean, if you look at, I mean, look at the girls. 10 years from now, they're going to be quite different. You know, to look at them, they'll, they'll be taller. You know, there's going to be a, a big difference that you definitely notice about them. But the fact is, then we're all going to change over the next 10 years. Each one of us are going to change. And whether you realise it or not, it's the decisions that you make each day that over the course of the next 10 years will have an incredible impact on your life. It's those little daily choices that you make. It doesn't matter who you are. You won't be the same person in 10 years' time. Do you understand that? In 10 years from now, you won't be the same. You'll be different. I mean, without getting into the whole science, but I mean, even your, your entire body will be different. You know, all the cells will turn over, guess what? You'll be made of someone, it'll be completely different material that makes you up. And obviously, depending on what you choose to scarf down in, those, in that decade is going to have an impact on what sort of, you know, what you're made up of. And here's the thing, those little decisions, those little decisions you make each and every day, that will play a big part in determining the kind of person that you'll be, the kind of person. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's actually a pretty exciting thing, to think, hey, that in 10 years from now, I can be completely different, you know? Because looking back over the last 10 years, you might look back over it and think, well, you know, the last 10 years, it might have been pretty good, you know? It might have been pretty bad. Chances are it was probably a bit of good and a bit of bad, a bit of a mixture, you know? But here's the thing. The next 10 years can be better than the last. They can be better than you even may have dared to hope that they would be. We've just read Genesis chapter number 14, and in Genesis chapter number 14, we saw there was a battle that was going on. There was a battle that went on between four kings on one side and five kings on the other side. Now, they weren't rulers over very large kingdoms. Like, you know, I mean, later on in the Bible, you read about places like, you know, like Babylon, you know, where they just ruled this huge, massive empire, you know, had the Medes and the Persians. I mean, even Israel itself, they ruled over an entire country, and sometimes they were were dominant over other countries, okay? But these, what what we're looking at here, when it talks about these these sort of kings, they're probably sort of rulers over what you describe as city-states, Okay, so just, you know, I mean, that's why we have, you know, the king of Sodom, for example, the king of Gomorrah, the king of these different places, you know, it's a king of just like a sort of a city. But the part of the chapter I want us to begin with this morning starts in verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. It says, And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. So the kings of Sodom, the the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, and some of these other kings, they get defeated. You know, those actual kings get killed, and the survivors, what do they do? They run away. They run away. And um, the, the, the victors, the, pe- the people who won the battle, they take all of the goods and the food from Sodom and Gomorrah, and they also take Lot, Abraham's nephew, captive. Look at verse number 11. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their vittles, and yes, that is how you pronounce it, vittles, it's not victuals, and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, so that's his nephew, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. So, they, they, this battle gets lost by the king of Sodom, king of Gomorrah, and so they, they take captive Lot, because Lot was living in Sodom. He was in Sodom, and so he gets taken captive. Now you might say, well, why was Lot in Sodom in the first place? Why was it that he was there? Well, in fact, we said on the same page, look at Genesis chapter number 13. In Genesis chapter number 13, um, Abraham had been down to Egypt. He went down to Egypt and he took Lot with him. And it says in chapter number 13, and Abram went, Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. So they went down into Egypt and then they come back, back up out of Egypt. And when they come out of Egypt, basically they, they have herds and flocks and things with them. They've got a whole pile of livestock with them. And there's actually... Verse number 7, it says there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. 
and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. So they're fighting, I suppose, because if you've got lots of cattle, it's like, well, who's going to have this bit of land? You know, you're trying to feed the cattle, you've got to find some good land. It's like, oh, I was here first, who's going to have this? And so Abram, he says, look, let's not have any strife between me and you. Let's not have any strife between my herdmen and, and thy herdmen. You know, he says, we're brethren. And he says, look, is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So he gives Lot a choice. He says, if you, if you go that way, I'll go the other way. If you want that part, I'll go the other way. So he's saying, look, you know, you can have the choice. In other words, he's saying, you pick the best part, whatever you want to choose, and I'll have whatever's left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose them all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. So he gives Lot the choice, Lot chooses, and he chooses the place that looks really good, it's well watered. He says it's like the Garden of God. He says it's like the land of Egypt. Now, interesting, you might sort of wonder, how did he know what the land of Egypt was like? Because he'd just come back from Egypt. Him and Abraham and Lot had just come back from Egypt. What was he doing down in Egypt in the first place? Well, guess what? Abraham, Abraham took him down there. He said, let's go down to Egypt. Even though God had said, you know, this is where you're supposed to be. But he decided he was going to go down to Egypt. He took Lot with him. And then Lot says, oh, I want this land because it's a bit like Egypt. It reminds me of Egypt. And so he chose that. Look at verse number 12. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. So the reason why Lot was in Sodom was because he'd chosen this area, which was very near there, and not only that, he pitched his tent toward Sodom. So every day when he comes out the tent door, he looks at, what's he looking at? He's looking at Sodom. He's looking at Sodom. And then lo and behold... Chapter 14, he's dwelling inside of Sodom. Now, was Sodom a place, a good place, a place where he should have been? No, in fact, you're there in um, Genesis 13, we just read verse 12, look at verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. It was an exceedingly wicked place. That's not the place that Lot should have gone. Okay? And the thing is, if you go and, you know, a bit of a lesson there, if you go and hang around wicked people, be in a wicked place, bad things might happen to you. You know, you might find that people come and you get destroyed, you know, and taken captive. Okay? Um, but let's get back to chapter number 14. Uh, verse number 13, chapter number 14. And there came one that escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Ishkol, the brother of Anur. These were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobar, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the woman also, and the people. So Abram rescues Lot. He rescues the others who are taken captive with him. Now, does Abram do it by himself? No, he's got other people helping him. Specifically, he's got 318 armed, trained servants. He's got 318 armed, trained servants. And they fight against them. They defeat the enemy and they bring back all that was taken by them. Now, when it says that they were armed, what do you think that's talking about? Do you think they had, you know, submachine guns or grenades or... What do you think they were armed with? Swords. Swords and spears and yeah, things. Like, yeah, exactly. Um, most likely, they would have been armed with some sort of swords. Um, in fact, you actually find the word, well, it's not mentioned here, but it says they smote them. They must have whacked them or something. Yeah. And um, you find the word sword, I think it occurs over 400 times in the Bible. Yeah. Now, when we read these accounts, because obviously this is, this is something that happened a long time ago, what does this have to do with us today? Well, it says in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. In other words, there are things that we can learn from these things that were written aforehand that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What can we learn from this account in Genesis chapter number 14? Do we need to be armed, you know, with swords like Abram's servants were in order to win great victories? Because he had these 318 servants, they were armed, they were trained. Is that what we need? Turn if you were to um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, see if you can guess whether we should be armed and trained in the way that Abram's servants were. 
um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, and verse number 3, says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So notice, it says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So this is not talking about, it's not a physical battle that we're in. Turn if you to Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 12. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 12. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Notice, it's not against flesh and blood, it's not a physical battle, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So notice, it's a spiritual battle as opposed to a physical battle. He says, wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Look down at verse number 17. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So notice, it's not a physical battle we're in, it's a spiritual battle. And what do we see here? The sword of the Spirit. And what is that? In case we wondered, it's the word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so the word of God, this is a weapon. It's not a physical sword. It is a spiritual sword. You don't need to turn there, but in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. So notice, the word of God, it's quick. That means that it's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. In other words, the Bible... It's actually, this is better than a physical sword. It's sharper than a physical sword. It's a weapon. It's the weapon that we need to be armed with. Turn if you to Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 16. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 16. <clears throat> and it says, And he had in his right hand seven stars. Let's talk about Jesus. And out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So notice, coming out of his mouth is a sharp, two-edged sword. Look at um, chapter number 2 and verse number 12. Chapter number 2 and verse number 12, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. This is Jesus. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou Holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent! or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So notice this sword, it's coming out of his mouth. What's he fighting against? He's fighting against the wicked doctrine, the wicked teaching that they have. You don't need to turn there, but it says in Hosea chapter 6 verse 5, Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets. What does it mean to hew something? It means to hack it with a sword, slash and hack, to hew something. You know, it says I've hewed them, by the prophets, I've slain them by the words of my mouth. And so the weapon that we need to be using, it's God's word. It's God's word. Think about when Satan came and tempted Jesus in Matthew chapter number 4. Remember, he came and tempted him. And how did Jesus respond each time? He responded with, it is written. It is written. It is written. He was wielding the sword of the Spirit. Well, we need to be armed with the same weapon. But not only do we need to be armed... Remember what it said in Genesis chapter 14, verse number 14? Genesis 14, 14 says, And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Not only were Abram's servants armed, they were trained. They were trained. This morning we're going to be starting a short series of sermons called Sword Training 101. Sword Training 101. It's kind of like, you know, if you do a course, you know, if you're studying a course and you, you do 101, it's kind of like that's the, that's the foundational course. You've got to do that 101 before you do the other ones that follow on from that, maybe in second year and other sort of more advanced papers. Yeah. So here's the thing, you've got to get these concepts down before you go on to anything else. The title of the sermon this morning, Sword Training 101, 
we're going to be talking about hearing and reading. Hearing and reading. And you might think, that sounds a bit basic. That sounds a bit basic. But we need to realise the basics are something that is really important. You know, I used to do karate training years ago, and the, the big thing they emphasised over and over again, do you know what it was? Basics. They talked about it. I don't know how many times. You know, whenever, whenever, whenever the word karate comes into my head, the thing that comes straight in is basics. Because there's all these black belts wandering around. It was just all about the basics, the basics, the basics. You know? I mean, we used to do these classes, and you know, the beginners come in off the street, and they're just you know, learning these things. And what would happen is the, the, more, the, the higher grades, they would want, you'd have a guy that was taking the class at the front, he'd be shouting out, do this and do that. But there'd be higher grades that would be wandering around, and they'd be just, you know, no, you need to move your feet slightly. You need to adjust this. You need, no, you need to sink down lower. You've got to pull this up higher. They'd be just little wee, tiny little things. Just, you think, does that really matter? That's what they did over and over and over again. Focus on the basics. It's a really important thing. You know? And then what would you do with the basics? You'd then repeat. You'd repeat it. You'd repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. You know? I was, um, the, the point of that is you want to repeat it so that it becomes natural. So that what you do naturally is, is, is what you're trying to do. You know? I, mean, I was watching this video by a guy who was, um, he used to be, he was, he was the, like the number one squash player, world, world number one squash player, years and years ago. He's pretty old now. But he talked about practicing over and over. Practicing over and over. You know, and he, he kind of invented this, this, this form of this thing called ghosting, which they do, where they, you know, it's basically without a ball, you know, you've got, you've got your racket in your hand and you sort of run for part of the court and you play a shot and then you go back to it and you just do that without a ball. And you do it again and again and again and again. But by doing that, it's kind of like a pianist. Think about how pianists, they'll do their drills, you know, they do this, the scales and whatever it is. And so they, they get, you know, they can just, they're skilled at it. And that becomes automatic. It's like, the, I think they talk about muscle memory. You know, like when someone's a touch typist, when they're typing, they're not thinking, I'm going to push this key and this key and this key. It's kind of like, I mean, that, that happens at the start. But once you become a, a, you know, a skilled typist and you type really quickly, it's like the word is in, your, in your, is in your mind and it's like automatically the combination of letters just comes out really quickly. You know, a friend of Maureen's like, she's just amazing. She's like, I don't know, 100 words a minute or more than that. She's a, it's amazing how far. Because, you know, she's not thinking of this letter, this letter, this. It's just become automatic. Yes. It's just become completely automatic. And that's the important thing of just going over and over and over, you know? And they're saying, well, but I mean, surely if you do that, you get sick of it. It wouldn't, it's not going to benefit you in the long run. You know, I mean, you, 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 you'll get tired out. In fact, I think that's what the guy said on the video. He talked about someone who started ghosting when he was 12 years old. He said, this is probably of the professionals, the guy who did the most training in this particular method of ghosting. And he said, he's been doing it since he was 12, and people were like, oh, he's going to, you know, his body's going to pack up. He's going to go to pieces. Well, interestingly enough, this, the same person ended up being the oldest ever world number one in squash. He was like 30-something, rather. Yeah. I can't remember, 36 or something like that. He's pretty old. And, and one of the things this guy was known for, he was known for his movement. Yeah. If so, who's the best person at moving on the court? Yeah. And it's this, this old guy. And he's super, why? Because he's just done it over and over and over. So it's important we understand repetition, repetition until it becomes second nature. You might say, well, I mean, isn't that a bit excessive to go over the same things again and again? Do we really need to do that? Well, look if you would at um, 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 12. 2 Peter chapter number 1 verse 12. And while you're turning there, I'll read to you from Philippians chapter 3 verse 1. Philippians chapter number 3 and verse 1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So Paul said, guess what? Writing the same things. And if you read Paul's letters, you ever notice that you know, you're reading through Ephesians and you're reading through Colossians. It's like, hang on, haven't we, haven't we heard this before? Does he say the same thing? Does he say the same thing? Why? Because it's, he repeats it. He repeats it. You know? And that's, that's one of the reasons, that's one of the problems with these, 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 um, these modern Bibles where they take things out of the Bible. And often they'll take things out of the Bible where it's not that it's completely gone, it's just that it doesn't say it there. And, and their excuse is to say, well, someone actually added it in. Someone added it in. But no, God said it more than once because we need to hear it again and again and again. He says to write the same things to you. He says it's not grievous, but for you it is safe. You're there in Second Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 12. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse number 12. He says, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. 
Peter says, look, if I didn't remind you of these things, and how often? Always. If I didn't always remind you of these things, I would be negligent. I'd be negligent. What happens if you neglect something? It falls to pieces. You know, something that's it's like my car, you know, it's, 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 it's been neglected. And it looks it. You know, we shouldn't be like that in our spiritual life. He says, I, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them. He says, look, you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I'm in this tabernacle. He's saying, as long as I'm in this body, as long as I'm alive, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. He's reminding them. Like, he's not teaching them something new. He's reminding them of stuff that he already knows. You might think that someone's come on to church. It's like, haven't I heard this before? Yep, you have. Because guess what? I'm reminding you. I'm reminding myself. Because that's what we need to do. You know? He says, knowing that surely I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me, moreover I will endeavour that you may be able, after my decease, after I've died, to have these things always in remembrance. It's important to have them always in remembrance. Look at chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 1. He says, The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So he says, guess what? First Peter and second Peter. I'm reminding you of things. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, the Lord and Saviour. So what's he reminding them of? The words. The words that were spoken. God's word, the apostles' word, that's what he's reminding them of. Look at verse number 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, so he's saying, look, you know these things, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. He says, look, you know these things. He says, beware, lest you get led away with the error of the wicked. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So it's important to go over these things and to remember and to remember and to remember. So what are we talking about this morning? We're talking about hearing and reading. We're talking about sword training. And what's the sword? This is the sword. The weapon we have as believers is the word of God. But if the Bible is our weapon, how good are we at using it? How good are we at using this weapon? You see, it's not much good having a Bible that just collects dust on a shelf. You know, you might have a Bible that's sitting at home and it's on a bookshelf and it's just there gathering dust. You know, maybe you get it out now and again, you know, maybe you bring it to church. But if you want to become skillful with this weapon, then you need to spend time using it. You've got to spend time using it. I mean, this is not, I've brought along this, this is my old Bible. And this Bible, I think, I've, I've, I last used it sort of regularly, maybe it was about a year ago, I think. I think I've had this one for a year, something like that. Yeah. And I had this Bible for about seven or eight years. Yeah. Seven or eight years. Yeah. And how did it get into the state? I just left it at home on the shelf. No, I used it. I used it and used it, and you just use it until it starts to fall to bits. Pages start to fall out. You sell a tape a few in, it's like yeah. it's just getting a bit packed, and so it's time to get a new one. But guess what? This Bible should end up looking like this one. Now, it might take slightly longer because this one's more expensive. But it's still going to wear out. You know? I remember the, the pastor of a church I was at, not the previous one, but the one before that. He's got this Bible, this massive big Bible, and it's just like falling to bits. It's falling to bits. He's gone over and over and over. It's a used Bible. In fact, there's another, another pastor who was there. I remember him saying, it's, that, what's it saying? It goes, um, what is it? Dirty Bible, clean Christian. Clean Bible, dirty Christian. You know? It's, it's important. We have to be using God's Word. I mean, here's, here's another Bible I use quite a bit. This one here. This is my soul winning Bible. And it's starting to fray. It's starting to, you know. Why? Because it's used. You use it. In fact, it's actually, if you look, it's got the, the pages are all a bit funny because it. Sometimes it rains, and the rain goes on it, then it dries again, and so it goes a bit crinkly and stuff. But it's, a, it, do you know, it naturally just turns to places, you know? You know, you, well, Revelation 20. I don't have a bookmark there, but it just opens there all the time, because it just opens so often. You turn there, and you turn there, and you turn there. We need to be using it. Use it. And use it until it, it's like, until it becomes part of you. You know? I'm going to talk about that, that old squash player before. We've often been and seen really good players playing at tournaments and stuff, like A-grade squash players. And the thing you notice, you see them, just like when they're warming up and stuff like that. And doesn't it seem like 
their racket is part of them. It just seems like it's an extension of their body. It's just part of them because they've used it and they've used it and they've used it. You know, um, it talks about um, when um, some of David's men were in, a, were in a battle and it talks about one of them says, and he says, and his hand clave to the sword. He fought and he fought and fought until his hand was just stuck. His hand clave to the sword. That's what we should be like. That's what we should be like. Now here's the thing. Imagine if Abram and his men had pursued those armies. They went to rescue Lot and everyone else. And then imagine if he handed them a sword for the first time. So they go chasing after him, him and his threat. They go and chase after them. They're there, they're going to fight. And then Abram, Abram goes, here you go. Here's the sword, everyone. And everyone's like, what's this? Imagine that. Imagine if they'd never had their hands on a sword before and Abram had just given it to them right then for the first time. You know, it's like if someone picks up a squash racket for the first time and they've never done any rackets. You can tell when someone's never, picked, you know, the way they hold it, the things they do, it's like they don't know how to use it. Imagine if that's what would happen. Well, what would have happened to Abram? What would have happened to his men? Probably the outcome of the battle would have been pretty different. They would have chased after them, but the, you know, the, the predator would have become the prey. That's what would have happened. They were chasing after them, but they would have, they would have turned and fled. It would have been a different story. Why? Because if they were armed, but if they weren't trained. It's not just enough to be armed, you also have to be trained. You see, if they didn't know how to use their weapons, it would have been a completely different story. So here's the thing. You're in a spiritual battle. What you need to do is get armed. Does everyone have a Bible here? Good. Do some training. Get armed, but do some training. You know, what sort of training should you do? Well, What we're talking about this morning, we're talking about hearing and reading. Hearing and reading. You know, a great way to do some hearing is, how about this, come to church. Come to church. You know, Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25, it says, um, uh, what does it say? Let me have a look. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. It says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling ourselves together as a manner of summers, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, if you come to church, you're going to be exhorted. You're going to, you're going to hear God's word. You're going to hear God's word preached. You're going to hear God's word sung. You're going to listen to God's word. You know, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15 says, um, uh, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, and that says the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar and ground of of the truth. And so God's house, that's supposed to be where you find the truth. Look at um, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 1. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse number 1. This is Paul writing to Timothy, a young preacher. He says to him, look, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead that is appearing in his kingdom, preach. But he doesn't just say preach, does he? He says preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. What does that mean? He says, preach the word. It means you need to do it when it's in season. You know when you've got those, the fashionable clothes, when things are in season, when they're in style? But when it's out of season. That means when it's not in style. That means when it's not popular. And guess what? Some, of the, some Bible preaching is not popular these days. It's not popular. But he says, I oh, preach it when it's in season and when it's out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So they don't want to listen to the truth anymore. Jesus said, sanctify them by their truth. Thy word is truth. So we need to be in a church. We need to be hearing God's word. Remember we sang it earlier on, Matthew 4, 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. We need it. And we sang Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. We need to be knocking. We need to be seeking in here. Seeking in God's word. There's lots of ways you can do it. You know, you obviously come to church, you can hear it. But you can listen yourself. I mean, having the Bible on MP3. Bible on MP3. You know, if you don't, don't have them, we've got flash drives here with, you know, the whole Bible. Listen to it. It's a great idea. You know, read the Bible out loud. It's a good thing. You say, why, why are you emphasising that? Why? Maybe because the Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, yeah. and hearing by the word of God. You know, it's important. Turn if you were to um, Isaiah, chapter number 34. 
Isaiah chapter number 34, actually turn to Psalm 40, excuse me, turn to Psalm 40 and verse number 7. While you do, I'll just read to you from Isaiah 34, 16. It says, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Look at Psalm 40 and verse number 7. It says, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. See, some people think, oh, you've got too much emphasis on the Bible. You should be emphasizing Jesus. But it says, look, lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me. That's where you find Jesus. You know, I mean, isn't that one of his names? The word of God? He says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Guess what? Where are you going to find God's will? In his word. Yea, thy law, your word, is within my heart. I've preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy love and kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Doesn't it, don't you get the impression that, that some people are hiding things? He says, look, I haven't hid thy righteousness within my heart, but I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy love and kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. There are people who, are high, who hide God's truth. They don't declare it all. The Apostle Paul said, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He says, I've kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. So if he's kept back nothing that's profitable, well, the Bible says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119 in verse number 147. Psalm 119 in verse number 147. It says, I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried, I hoped in thy word. See what? He got up before dawn. He was praying to God. He hoped in his word. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. So he stayed up late at night thinking on God's word. Look at um, verse 164. Verse 164. It says, seven times a day do I praise thee. What for? Because of thy righteous judgments. Because of thy righteous judgment. Seven times a day. Look at um, verse number 97. Verse number 97. Oh, how low are thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies. For they are ever with me. You want to be wiser than your enemies? Have God's commandments with you. Have them ever with you. I have more understanding than my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. Do you want to understand the Bible better than the people who have taught you the Bible? Then meditate in God's word. Learn God's word. Memorize his word. Read his word. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. How about that? Obey his word. I refrain my feet from every other way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Do you find like you're stumbling around sometimes? You're making mistakes, then what should I do? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But notice also it says, how sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. We should be desiring God's word. Psalm 1 verse 1 says, you know, um, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. It's important we do that. You know, we need to be doing it every day. We should be reading the Bible every day. Look, if we look at Deuteronomy chapter number 17. Deuteronomy chapter number 17 and verse number 18. Deuteronomy chapter number 17 and verse number 18. Deuteronomy 17 verse 18 says, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, this is talking about the king of Israel, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priests and Levites, and it shall be with him. So he needs his own copy, and it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. It's important. We need God's word. You know, Job said that... Um, Look at Job chapter number 23. Job chapter number 23 and verse number 12. Job chapter number 23 and verse number 12. Job chapter 23. It's a good thing to remember this in the morning. Job chapter 23 and verse number 12. He says, Neither have I gone back from thy 
from the commandment of his lips. I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Notice that. Needing God's word more than food. Now, do you need food to live? Absolutely. You do need food to live. But Job says, look, I need God's word more. Jesus said, man shall live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We need to make it a priority. That means it's the thing that you do first. The thing that you do first. Because, you see, the things that you do first, they always get done. Other things, they might get done or they might not. Turn to Nehemiah chapter number 8. Nehemiah chapter number 8. Nehemiah chapter number 8 and verse number 1. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 1. Nehemiah chapter number 8 and verse number 1, page 542, it says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. That's why they're saying, bring the Bible. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So everyone gathers. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. So he read from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood. So notice he have a wooden pulpit there, but what's it? it's actually standing on it. Yeah. Why? So that he can be higher than people, not because he's more important, but so they can hear him read. That's why. And he stood on the pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema and Aniah and Urijah and Hil- Hilkiah and Maasiah. On his right hand, on his left hand, Padiah and Mishael and Malchiah and Hashem and Hashbadana and Zechariah and Meshalem. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. That's why he's standing there. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Why? Why do you think they stood up? Why? Because it's important. There are many churches where they do that, where people stand when you read the Bible. Because when you're standing up, what, what can't you do when you're standing up? Fall asleep. Because <laughs> you, you, you fall over. You know? And I've done that before. Reading the Bible sometimes, memorizing the Bible sometimes, I've, I've done it and it's like I'm really sleepy. So I, I stand up and I walk around while I'm doing it. Because if you try and do it sitting in a seat, or God forbid, lying in bed, <laughs> he'll fall asleep. And he says here, and all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Jeshua, and Bani, and Sherebiah, and Jamin, and Achab, and Shebathiah, and Hodijah, and Maasiah, and Kalita, and Azariah, and Josabad, and Hanan, and Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So that's one, of the, that's one of the reasons why it's important to come to church. It's great to do Bible reading by yourself, but it's also good to come to church to get it explained. Yeah. See, because when we come to church, we don't just read the Bible. Now, we do read the Bible, but we don't just read the Bible. You know, that caused the people to understand it. And the people stood in their place. So they read in the book and the law of, the, of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So it's important we understand it's important that we understand. We need to be hearing God's word. We need to be reading God's word. You know? We need to have, I mean, have, a, have one of these. Have a Bible reading plan where you go through and you mark it off. Now, you don't have to use paper. A lot of people like do it on a computer or something like that. But have somewhere where you're checking it off so you know. You know when it's done. You know? I mean, maybe you missed out on completing the Bible in a year. You know, maybe you were trying to do it twice or four times a year and you didn't quite make it. Well, look, listen to it. That's what I recommend. Get on MP3 and listen to it. You know? The whole New Testament, it takes less than 18 hours. You know, the whole Bible is about 72 hours. Well, that's at Alexander's school beyond normal speed. And he's, um, you know, he does speak a bit slowly. Some of them just speed it up a bit. But you want to be listening and understanding, yeah. taking it in. But think about that. I mean, 18 hours, a bit less than that, that's basically two full working days. That means, say if you, you know, had to do some manual job like mowing lawns or something like that, did some, you, you did some work. Two full days of work, listening to the Bible on MP3 as you went, you'd hear the whole New Testament in two days. Just like that, you know? Now, some of you may have done a lot of training before in the past. Maybe you've been trained, well, you know, so that you're skilled in using it. But what happens if you stop training? 
What happens if you stop training? Now, there's a sense in which what you've learned, you're going to retain some of it. You know, you're not going to be the same after you've done some training. It's, it's like riding a bike. Isn't that what people say? You, know, you ride a bike, you know, you, you never forget once you ride a bike. But I mean, what would happen if you went for 10 years and you never rode a bike? How good would you be at riding a bike compared to somebody who rides a bike every day? There's a difference. There's a difference. The title of the sermon this morning is Hearing and Reading. Hearing and Reading. This is the first installment in the series Sword Training 101. And next week we're going to be looking at memorising the Bible, which is a very important but also neglected part of sword training. We started with hearing because that's how people usually come in contact with God's word is via hearing. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It says in John 8 verse 30, it says, as he spake these words, many believed on him. That's how people get saved. They get saved. They hear God's word. James 1.18 says, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. 1 Peter 1.23 says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. But you see, hearing is not just for the unsaved. Our faith can increase as we hear God's word. Spend some time listening to the Bible reading being read. I really recommend it. Spend some time listening to it. You know, you can do it when you're driving. It's a bit dangerous reading the Bible when you're driving, but listen to it while you're driving. Yeah. You know? It'll, it'll help you with pronouncing the names. You know, you get the names right if you listen to it being pronounced, although you might end up saying Eunice instead of Eunice, but because um, that's the way it's supposed to be pronounced, obviously. Pronunciation does change over time. But here's the thing. You can listen to a lot in a short period of time. You can listen to a lot. Hearing is important. Reading is also important. Reading is important. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 13. 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 13. 1 Timothy 4, 13 says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Till I come, he's told him, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. And obviously reading is there, but I mean exhorting, I mean, what are you exhorting people about? You're exhorting them about what's in, in, in the Bible. You, you know, to doctrine, where does your doctrine come from? All scripture is given by the of God and is profitable for doctrine. First Timothy was written so that Timothy would know how to behave in the church of God. That's why we give attendance to reading. If you come to both services today, you'll hear nearly 10 chapters of the Bible read and sung, probably more than that actually because we've done them multiple times. That doesn't include all the verses that we look up during the sermon. That's why, you know, that's why you should turn there. When I say turn to Ephesians 6, when I turn to 1 Timothy 4, actually turn to it. Turn to it. You might say, oh, well, you know, but I'm, I'm too slow. By the time I'm, you know, I'm, I'm partway there, and he's to turn somewhere else. But here's the thing. How do you think you're going to get better? How do you think you're going to get better? Are you going to get better at using a sword by using it, or by just thinking, well, I oh, know, I'm a bit slow, you know? No, do your best and try. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 4. 1 Peter chapter number 4. See so him get there before me, you probably will. My hands are slippery this morning. 1 Peter chapter number 4. Look at verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 4, it says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, look at this, arm yourselves, likewise with the same mind. Notice that. Arm yourselves. Being armed. That's having a weapon. Arm yourselves with the same mind. Where are you going to get the mind? Where are we going to get the mind of Christ from? Right here. Arm yourselves with the same mind. Look at verse number two. It says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. That's why we're reading God's word, to understand what God's word, what his will is. Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's why we need to be in God's word. Look at verse number three. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have brought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. You see, it's about God's will compared to the will of the Gentiles, the will of the world. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Jesus said, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. And it shall be done unto you. Look down at verse number 11. Verse number 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If you're going to speak, what should you be speaking? These are God's oracles. This is the words of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. The stuff that comes out of your mouth should be God's word. 
Okay, but you put it in your heart. Yeah. It says in Romans chapter number 3, he says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? He says, Much every way. Chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. What advantage did the Jews have? Yeah. They had God's word. They were given it to look after. That's an, adva- that's an advantage that you have. It's something that is profitable. Yep. You've got this weapon. You've got this weapon. Use it. Listen to it. Read it. Read it. Listen to it. Read it. Listen to it. Till I come, give attendance to reading. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, and Lord, I just pray you'd help each one of us. Give us a greater hunger for your words. Help us to, as Job, to desire the words of your mouth more than our necessary food. We need food to live. It's true that we shouldn't live by, you know, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of our mouth of God. But we do need, we do need bread to live. We do need food to live. But Lord, help us to desire your word more. Help us to feed on your word. Help us to listen to your word. Help us to love your word. Thank you for giving us your word. We live in a very privileged time. Much more than people have had in the past. Where not everyone possessed their own entire Bible. Like we have multiple Bibles. Not everyone had the ability to, to search through the Bible just in the click of a button. Help us to use what you've given us, Lord. Help us to determine just a little bit each day. And then more each day. And then more each day. Just like training with a physical sword. Just like training for some sporting achievement. To work and to work and to become skilled. That our swords would cleave to our hands. They would be a part of us wherever we go. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.